Welcome to North Central Arkansas. I'm in the heart of the Ozarks. I'm at War Eagle Mills. I'm Jim Debrock and I've spent the last 30 years going around videoing and photographing old water mills. Let's take a look around at this one. Welcome to War Eagle Mill. Today I'm going to show you this amazing mill site that to my surprise is also a busy tourist stop. It's easy to see why on a weekday this isolated location has about 40 folks milling around the grounds. The mill features a quaint general store complete with stone ground flour and grits, local honey, homemade soaps, and of course the highly coveted souvenir t-shirt. If you make the climb up to the third floor, you will find a courteous waitstaff and a really good BLT at the small restaurant. Well, it may be the food that brings folks to this site in the early spring, but the park itself surely brings hundreds more during the warm summer months. The refreshing water of War Eagle Creek is a popular swimming hole, and the sandbars downstream from the mill dam will provide a fun sunbathing spot. Upon arriving at the mill, you are greeted by the historic wooden plank steel truss bridge. Perched high above the creek, the combined view of the bridge and the mill is a very pleasing sight. The mill has a unique and troubled history though, including having burned twice and being wiped out by a flood. It is hard to believe that this picturesque location has been plagued with high water events. In fact, more than three major floods have impacted this incarnation of the mill over the last several decades. The mill is currently powered by what is called an undershot wheel. Typically, this style of wheel is underpowered for a mill of this size due to the amount of water required to rotate the wheel under load. More typical of a mill like this is the overshot wheel, which uses the weight of the water, gravity, and inertia to increase the horsepower. However, this type of setup usually requires a greater degree of fall in the elevation to achieve the necessary height to have the water go over the top of the wheel. As a photographer, I wish they had not covered the wheel with a steel enclosure. The water wheel is the iconic piece of hardware that mill enthusiasts are wanting to see. A third method of powering mills is the turbine. They had one on display in the side yard. Let's take a look. One of the ways that mills are powered are through turbines such as this one. These came around in the mid to late 1800s, were very popular all the way through the 1900s. These work differently than the overshot or undershot wheel that relies on water to cascade over top or underneath the wheel. These work on a premise about having water above these in a static uh, shaft or tube of some kind. And when you open these hatches, these little doors here, the water races in there and there's an impeller inside that turns under the weight of the water. These were more efficient use of the water because you could get more horsepower out of these. You will see these in some of the bigger mills and some of the modern mills from the 1900s and on. And you might be impressed to know that your hydroelectric dams today run off of a turbine very similar to this. So you have 1800s technology probably powering your house right now. Let's talk about the body of water that is behind me. The dam creates what they call a mill pond. So the mill dam backs up the water and creates a mill pond. This is a way to back up enough water to guarantee that the mill has enough power and enough water to be able to operate for sustained periods of time. If they just let the creek run through it, if the creek was low or whatever, then the amount of horsepower they had would be less. So the mill pond's role is to be able to back up enough volume of water to let the mill operate uh, in low water times or to operate efficiently for a long period of time if it was a busy mill. Let's 
let's talk about how the millwright would have made their living. Now, a millwright is the person who operated the mill. A lot of people will call him a miller for slang, but the correct term is a millwright. That's the person who operated the equipment, knew how to maintain the equipment, and knew how to adjust the equipment for the different sizes of grindings that you might want. Okay, so this, how that guy makes money is the farmer would bring their, their crops in, and let, let's use corn as the example. So the farmer would bring the, this year's crop in, it's already dried out on the cob, so the kernels on the cob are hard. They would have brought that corn cob to the mill. The first thing they would have done is weigh the wagon, and then they would have started to offload the, the corn uh, cobs into the bins. And what will happen then is an elevator would take them to a sheller of some sort. Now on a mill this size, they would have a large sheller. It would be able to peel the kernels off very quickly using the power of the mill. A smaller mill is going to have a hand crank type sheller, and you'll see them around at farm sales and different things like that. They're really cool. Pick one up if you get a chance. But the automation of this mill would have taken care of that. Once the kernels are off of the cob, then those kernels would go to whatever type of grinder they would have been using. Early incarnations of this mill probably used stone grinders to grind the corn. They would have a large uh, marble or granite or sometimes limestone wheel that has grooves in it to grind that corn. There's two opposing sides of that and one of them turns against the other and it pulverizes the corn kernels down to whatever size tailings or millings that you want. As the mill progressed through time, they would have upgraded to a roller mill or a burr mill, and that's where two steel drums roll against each other to crush the corn. Now, after you've got the product processed down, they would bag this up. The, if they just ground it down for feed corn, then the farmer most likely would have paid the, the mill right and went on its way. But if they ground it down to a flour-like consistency or did cornmeal with it, the miller probably would have shared in that crop, meaning they would have taken a part of that for themselves. After it was done, they would have bagged it up and then they would have been able to sell it to the town folk that were living nearby. Not everybody was a farmer, so they would be able to have product to sell. This method worked very well. Both the farmer and the millwright both got to make money from the crops that were grown here. It was a very efficient system. about how mills were the lifeblood of the communities. You would see the communities thrive when the mill was doing really well. You would see the communities fail when the mill went away, was destroyed by fire or flood or whatever. They really were the economic centers of the communities that they were nestled in. And it makes perfect sense. When the farmer was done with his crops, he would bring them to town to have them processed. They didn't come to town every day like you and I do. They would only come a couple of times a year. And during that trip, they would get their hair cut. They would go to the mercantile store and pick up supplies while the corn was being ground. It was a very big day for the country folks to come to town. When the mills dried up, so did the mercantile. Let's talk about the Blackburn family for a moment. Long about 1832, they homesteaded this piece of ground and they built a home similar to the one behind us on this site. Along about 1833 or so, the mill was completed and it began to operate. About 1838, the mill was destroyed by a flood, so they had to build another one. After a period of time, the grown boys, the Blackburn boys, there were five of them, they joined the Confederate Army for the Civil War. In an ironic twist of fate, when the Confederate Army was retreating from this location, they actually burned the Blackburn Mill down. It wasn't until about 1873 that one of the brothers returned and built a new mill on its location. Now, as luck would have it, that mill too burned after the turn of the century. Then the foundation and the ruins remained for a long time, and it wasn't until about 1973 or so that the current mill was rebuilt. So the mill that's on this site is a reproduction mill, and the equipment that's in it came from other mills around. But it's still very interesting to come here and explore this history and enjoy this really beautiful valley. I'm Jim Vibrock. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of War Eagle Mill. 
Let's go find another mill to explore.